We left off last time in Matthew chapter 7, verse 23. So we'll pick it up in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 today. Get your Bible and open it up to Matthew chapter 7. We will begin in just one moment. My name is Michael Moret. The name of this program is Scripture Verse by Verse. And if you want to study the Bible at your pace, at your convenience, talking about the whole Bible from Genesis through Revelation, if you want to do that verse by verse, you can do that at the Scripture Verse by Verse website, which is found at thebibleversebyverse.com. All you have to do is click on the book of the Bible that you want to study and click on the chapter and listen as I teach it verse by verse. All you need is your Bible at the Bible verse by verse dot com. And Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, <clears throat> Matthew 7, verse 24 Jesus says, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man who built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not. For it was founded upon a rock. A personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Daily time in the word of God and prayer and obedience to that word will give you a solid foundation for your life. You will still have trouble like everyone else but you will not crumble to pieces under the pressure. And in the end, everything will be okay. And when I say end, I mean eternity. No matter what happens to you in this life, if you're walking with the Lord, he will give you the strength and the peace to endure. And part of that enduring will be looking forward to eternity where all your troubles will be behind you. The unsaved have none of that. And those who call themselves Christians and are never in the word and don't repent and aren't living for Jesus, they don't have that either. In fact, they just have Christianity as their title, as their name. But it's not real. Not if you don't obey God. Not if you don't care about obeying God. 26. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, who built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Most people have a imitation foundation that they re rely on for their security. They rely on their 401ks. They rely on their investments. They rely on their family or friends or maybe some skill that they might have. But when the storm comes, and the market does a nosedive, or your friends move away, or your family dies, or you have an accident, and you lose that skill, your foundation is gone. And you learn the hard way that those things really never did provide security at all. And if none of those things should happen to you, someday you will be on your deathbed and then what good will the stock market do you? When you're in the hospice, you will be in the same situation as the pulper, as the friendless person, as the homeless guy who didn't have any family or friends or money. 
your situation will be no different than his. In fact, his situation will be better than yours if Jesus Christ is his, is his Lord and Savior because at least when he dies, he'll be okay and you won't. Verse 28. And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. You know, the scribes, they were always quoting other scribes when they taught. That's, and a scribe was a, was a so-called expert in the law, the law of God, the word of God. So you had these Bible teachers that were constantly quoting other Bible teachers for their authority. This is what Rabbi Jones teaches about this. And he might be right. However, Rabbi Smith says this, so he might be right instead. I would rather stay home and read the Word of God myself than listen to that type of thing. If I went to a church and I heard the pastor quoting other preachers and other Bible teachers and commentaries and so on and so forth, I'd come home and I'd be in a bad mood all day. Or I'd have to fight being, a bad, being in a bad mood all day. I'd have to get in the Word, cleanse my soul. Jesus spoke the Word of God. He did not appeal to anyone or anything other than the Word of God. You know, Jesus never once said when he was teaching, well, this is my opinion. Jesus never once said, I think. I had a professor in college. This was secular college before I was saved, down in Madison. I told this story, I think, once before. He lectured for 40 minutes. And I was bored to begin with. But I sat and I listened the best that I could. And after his 40-minute lecture, he ended his lecture by saying, I think. I couldn't believe it. I can still remember my act reaction. I was 20 years old. And I was so frustrated. I didn't know what truth was. But I sure felt like I wanted it. And he wasn't giving it to me. I just listened to a guy talk for 40 minutes. And he finishes his talk by saying, I think? You mean, you're not sure what you said was true? You mean, I would give me truth. I wasn't even saved and I wanted truth. No wonder I love the Word of God. Jesus never said, I think. Or, this is my opinion. Or, this is what so-and-so thinks. He said, this is right and this is wrong. Because this is what the Word of God says. He didn't appeal to anyone or anything other than Holy Scripture. This is right because the Scripture says so, and this is wrong because the Scripture says so. Jesus kept his message simple, clear, and straightforward, and people were not used to hearing that sort of thing. People are not used to hearing that sort of thing today either. But that's the way the Word of God should be communicated. Several years ago, I was preaching in front of a, a large group, and I had a, a modern evangelical type, you know. He came up to me, and after he came up to me, he said, actually, he didn't come up to me. Well, yes, he did. Um, in a question and answer time, he said, well, because I was speaking the word of God with authority. I was saying, this is what the Bible, this is true. This is true because this is what the Bible says. I'm telling you, this is true. I spoke the word of God with authority. He wasn't used to that. He was listening, he was used to listening to all these modern evangelicals that are a dime a dozen on Christian radio that are forever quoting other people just like the scribes and never taking a dogmatic stand for anything, even when the Word of God is crystal clear. <clears throat> so I did, and he said, well, I only have one Lord, and he's Jesus. Well, no kidding, no kidding, buckwheat. I only have one Lord, too. 
I said, I don't have the authority, but I'm giving you the word of God and I'm speaking it with authority because it's the word of God and God is the authority. And that's what I said. People are not used to hearing the kind of teaching that Jesus did, even today. But that's the way the Word of God should be communicated. Chapter 8. When he was come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. Truth is like a magnet. That is, truth has drawing power. You know, a magnet, you ever mess around with a magnet? A magnet draws metal, but it also repels other things, right? If you put two magnets together and you have the same charge facing each other, they push apart. And truth is like a magnet. Because it draws those who are hungry for truth. They gravitate to it. Just like a magnet. And it repels those who hate truth. That person that I was just talking about. He didn't want truth. He wanted his comfortable, modern evangelicalism. But he sure didn't want truth. He wanted a way out. To satisfy his compromising. And I didn't give him that luxury when I taught. Because the word of God doesn't give him that luxury. He wouldn't like that. He didn't like that. He didn't like truth. He liked suggestions. He liked encouragement. He liked suggestions. He liked sharing. He wanted somebody to share their message. He didn't want the word of God preached or even taught. He wanted it shared. But not too dogmatic. He didn't want truth. He was repelled from it. Just like a, a magnet repels another magnet. People may not always like truth, but most will never forget it once they hear it. That's the Holy Spirit's job, burning it inside of their soul. Hopefully never letting them get away from it. Although they do, if they don't repent. And then they're in big trouble. Verse 2, And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Now this man, who was in a desperate situation, because there was no cure for leprosy, and it was so contagious that you had to live separated from society. You couldn't even, you couldn't be by your, your wife, your, your husband, your children, no working. You had to live in a separate, isolated colony called a leper colony. And you were completely and totally dependent on people who might bring some food out there for you. It was a horrible life. And that's what this man had. And he had faith in Jesus' ability. He just wasn't sure if Jesus wanted to heal him. And that's the way it is with us, too. There is no blanket promise to Christians that God wants you healed. You won't find that. There's no blanket promise that God wants you healed. And if it's not, if you're not healed after praying, it's not a lack of faith. If you prayed, it's not a lack of faith. If you prayed, you did what this leper did. In essence, he prayed. But he's leaving the result up to Jesus. And that's the way it should be with us too. You have no choice because you're not sovereign. And neither am I. When we pray for physical things or material things, 
We know that God can do it, but we don't know if it is his will. And we have to leave that in his hands. Verse 4, And Jesus saith unto him, See, thou tell no man, but go thy way. Show thyself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. So he healed this man, and he said, But now I don't want you to tell anyone. I want you to go straight to the priest and, uh, and, and offer the gift for cleansing that is prescribed in the Mosaic Law. And it will be a testimony unto the priest. See, the Jews were looking for a leader. Someone who could lead them to victory over Rome. Many of them were starting to think that Jesus could be that leader and should be that leader. They figured anyone who could do miracles like he did would be just what was needed to pull off a big miracle and defeat the Roman Empire. And that's why Jesus downplayed his miracles. At least one of the reasons he downplayed his miracles. Verse 5. And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion, beseeching him, and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home, sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. Centurions were not Jewish. Centurions were Roman officers in charge of at least 100 soldiers. So this Roman officer had a servant. Most masters wouldn't care if their servant was sick, but this one did. And so verse 7, And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof. Stop there for a second. This man was an important officer. But he was humble in the presence of Jesus. He said, Jesus, I'm not good enough to have you come into my house. You and I may be important to some people, but no one is important compared to God. Verse 8, Centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. He's saying, I'm not good enough to have you come over to my house. Plus, it's not even necessary, because I believe in you, Jesus. I believe in your power. This man knew that Jesus' power was not restrained by time or space. It didn't matter if Jesus was halfway around the world. All he had to do was say, Servant, you are healed. And that would be that. And that's what this centurion believed. That's pretty good for a non-Israelite, wouldn't you say? That's pretty good for somebody who probably didn't know the first thing about the Word of God. But notice verse 9. Here's his reasoning. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, Go, and he goeth, and to another come, and he cometh, and to my servant do this, and he doeth it. This man knew about authority. When you're in the Roman army, you know about authority. And he was in charge of at least 100 soldiers, too. So when he gave an order, his men obeyed without hesitation. They didn't ask why. They just obeyed. And when one of his superiors gave an order to him, he obeyed without hesitation, too. That's just the way it is. When you're under authority and you have authority. And he says, Jesus, 
If you tell my servant sickness to leave his body, it will leave without a hesitation because you got that authority. Verse 10. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. This foreigner who didn't even know the one true God had more spiritual sense than many of the Israelites who were brought up on the Bible. Verse 11, and Jesus continues, And I say unto you, that many shall come from the east and the west, and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. So what Jesus is saying is that this Roman officer is just the tip of the Gentile iceberg. Jesus is saying there are going to be a lot of Gentiles from all over the world in heaven. And they're going to get there through me. 12. But the sons of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You know, some people don't believe that hell is everlasting. They think that when you hit the fire, you go out of existence. I honestly believe that many of those people who teach that, and it's becoming popular in modern Christianity. And I swear, I think, that the reason so many people teach that is because, is because they have a loved one or a friend who died without Christ. And they want to somehow, at least in their own pathetic little mind, deliver that person from hell. So they come up with this doctrine of annihilation. And maybe a lot of them do it for themselves too because they can't bear the thought of repenting of their sin and submitting to the Lordship of Christ nor can they bear the thought of suffering forever in hell. So they, you know, find a nice middle ground and say, yeah, there's a hell, but you go out of existence. Can't prove it from Scripture. There would, there would not be any weeping and gnashing of teeth if there weren't people alive in the lake of fire, my friends. See how easy it is to teach the truth? It is, you know, I'm not very smart. I did get A's in Bible college. I didn't before that. Ooh, grade school, high school. After fifth grade, no, after fourth grade. My grades went downhill because I didn't care. High school too, man. I just scraped through and got a, and got a diploma. I was terrible. And even in that secular college that I went to, for a couple of years. Well, I, I was bad there too. I didn't care until I started teaching the Bible or until I started studying the Bible. I got A's. I got A's, all A's in theology, Bible, um, just all A's. I honestly did. Can't believe it. I'm not bragging. I'm just, I say that because just to say that I have a hunger for God's word and I'm just so intensely in love with God's word. And that's why I was able to get good marks. But it's not because I'm smart, but I'm smart enough to know that you can't gnash your teeth and be in agony if you're not in existence. It's so easy to teach the Word of God. It's so easy to teach a truth. I can do it because the truth is so simple. You don't have to be a scholar. It's there. It's simple just have to have the guts and the love for Jesus to do it. You know, the sophisticated preachers, the intellectuals, they spend most of their time explaining God's word away, trying to impress us. Not impress me, it bores me. Just give me the straight word of God. I don't have time. And if you can't give me a straight word of God, I'll open up my Bible and I'll read it myself and the Holy Spirit will give me the straight word of God. Eh, you're much better off doing that. Wow. Let's read verse 12 again. But the sons of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You know, what Jesus is saying 
is that many people who had a golden opportunity to be in heaven will instead be in hell. My friends, hell is the lake of fire. And people who go there spend forever in flames. I said in flames. There is weeping and gnashing of teeth because the pain is so horrendous. And many people, many people who had a golden opportunity to go to heaven will go to hell. Many who knew the word of God and even believed the facts about Jesus and believed in Jesus for a while, will say, you know what, I'm finished. The cost of following Christ is way too high. I don't want to be connected to you, Jesus. They will choose their sin. They will choose comfort and acceptance in this life. And they will, by default, choose hell. And that is where they will be forever rather than choosing to submit to Jesus, to receive him as Lord and Savior, and therefore go to heaven. And so Jesus warns that many of the sons of the kingdom will be cast into outer darkness. Many who were in the kingdom and others who had a golden opportunity to be in the kingdom walk away from it and go to hell. Their choice. You're looking at one person or you're listening to one person who's not going to shed one tear over them. Not in eternity, I'm not. I can weep and pray for them and beg for their salvation in this life, yes. But once I hit eternity, they're going to be gone and forgotten, not worthy of another thought if they chose to reject Christ. Verse 13, And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed in the very same hour. Boy, I never put any limits on God. The Roman officer believed that Jesus could handle this healing. He could handle healing his servant from long distance. And so he asked, and Jesus did it. You know, there are times in Scripture when God said that he would have done more if he had only been asked to do more. God won't give us more than we can handle, but sometimes we don't even have close to what we could handle because we have not asked for it. Never limit God. He won't do anything contrary to his word, but there's a whole lot of area within the word that you have things to pray for. Live the word, pray the word, you'll be in good shape. Out of time. Continue studying the Word of God with me at thebibleversebyverse.com. Bring your Bible. Click on the Bible book you want to study. Click on the chapter. Open your Bible and listen. It's that simple. We can study the whole Word of God together at thebibleversebyverse.com. In fact, you can study three complete series going through the entire Bible from Genesis through Revelation using my audio Bible messages right there at thebibleversebyverse.com. I'm not underwritten by a large church or denomination. I never have been. This is simply a faith ministry where I teach the Word of God, which I have been for over 30 years. I teach the Word of God, and I trust that God will use it, that His Word will not come back to Him void, and that he will move your hearts, those of you who love God's word, to want to be a part of this ministry and help get out the word of God to a world that desperately needs it. You can be a part of this ministry by praying for me, praying for the word, and clicking the donate button 
at the top of the front page at thebibleversebyverse.com and prayerfully given as the Lord may lead. Until next time.